Hey everyone and welcome to another rum adventure with the rum cast. We are the podcast that talks all things rum related with the people who love and shape it. We have a fantastic interview episode lined up today with one John Barrett, the owner of independent bottler Bristol Spirits Limited. He is such a gentleman and has been in the spirits industry for quite some time. It was a really fabulous interview, but First and foremost, let me introduce the co-host of the Rumcast, the Daniel Day-Lewis to my Gene Wilder, you might say, both of whom, by the way, cut their teeth at Bristol Old Vic Theater School. I was uh, wondering Mr. what the connection there was. Wow. <laughs> yes. Mr. Will Hookingo. Will, what's going on in your rum corner lately? Well, I was trying to rack my brain and think of what movie <laughs> Gene Wilder and Daniel Day-Lewis were in together. Because that sounds like it'd be a pretty good movie. but It does, actually. Yeah. yeah I was like, was Daniel Day-Lewis in uh, Willy Wonka? Was he in Blazing Saddles? Like, I was going back through the, you know, everything. And I, wow. Okay. I almost went with John Cleese, uh, who was born in nearby Bristol. Uh-huh. But yeah, okay. yeah, didn't didn't go there. So I figured, let's stick with the school. So anyhow. I'm, I'm doing well here. I just, I actually completed a project I've been meaning to get to for a while now here at the house this past weekend. I reorganized my rum cabinets. Have you done this recently, John? When's the last time you kind of took stock and and, and organized your stuff over there? Dude, I'm so glad you asked this because I am super overdue for it. Yeah. And it's been mulling around in my mind how the heck am I going to do this? Uh, okay, and in good. fact, I, I think I was just telling you pre-recording here that right. like I, I have so much rum that I really have to start thinking about. You're running out how, of room. Yeah. So yeah, tell me about your, your process here. And so maybe I can take some notes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm mainly bringing this up because I want to hear what all I know we have some listeners out there who have very large rum collections larger than both of us probably and I'd love to hear what what your approaches are if you're listening to organizing your rum cabinet rum shelf rum library rum pantry whatever you do send us an email host at rumcast.com and let us know you know your approach i'd love to see some some various approaches to this uh, that we can share with the rum community but basically the way mine works is we have some built-in cabinets downstairs Mm -hmm. in our living room and they have kind of they're like two-tiered you know so you open it up and there's a shelf in the middle and so i i have had about three of those cabinets claimed for spirits for a while now and it's not just rum it's other stuff too and i'd have okay. i'd have like everything kind of mixed up in there you know and it's the kind of situation where stuff gets behind other stuff and you have to reach way back in there to pull it yeah. out and it can yeah. get hard to see where everything is uh, yep, yep and i always knew i need to split some of this up like i need one cabinet that's just rum one cabinet that's everything else and i finally A small now, cabinet yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was my starting point was just I pulled out everything and I took, you know, I, you know, I've got a few bottles of whiskey, a few bottles of tequila, some mezcal, some Amaros, liqueurs, things like that. Mm-hmm. I took all that stuff and put it in another cabinet. So I had these two that are joined together that are just for rum. And then, you know, I was saying there's kind of the shelf in the middle. On the bottom shelf, I have rums that are primarily mixed for stuff or like easy drinking rums, I would say. And then the top shelf is the higher proof stuff, the more stuff I'm not going to mix in a cocktail. Mm -hmm. So honestly, that sounds so simple and just like something I should have done from day one. But just doing that has been a breath of fresh air every time I open the cabinet. It's fantastic. And the other thing I did was I took inventory as I was doing all this. So I pulled up a little Google sheet and I just listed all the rums and I haven't, you know, there's, there's, a number of ways I could organize this inventory. And I'm thinking of just doing it for fun and and just being a nerd. I kind of want to have a few different tabs. So right now I have one where everything is organized by age. Mm -hmm. And I have five different age categories. They're kind of loose age categories, but I have unaged, aged and filtered, lightly aged, moderately aged, and long aged to okay. kind of break things up and just kind of get a visual of yeah. where where it's a pivot, right? Where yeah. are most of my rooms? Yeah. And then I'm also going to do another tab that's by country. And I think I might stop there. I know there's other classification systems. There's the Smuggler's Cove one. There's right. the Gargano classification. I don't right. really need to get that granular with this mm-hmm. because this is for an audience of one, really. It's just <laughs> for me to look at. So 
but the whole exercise has been pretty fun. And yeah. I, I have to say, just going to the cabinet to pull something out, out now, it's, it's, I feel like I just went through spring cleaning. It's fantastic. I'd encourage other people to, to make your own little weekend project where you go back and organize. It'll, yeah. it'll make your life easier. Well, you know, the key to any of those plans is also maintenance, right? Because once upon a time, I did that same thing you did in terms oh, yeah. of cleaning everything out, inventoried everything, had it all where I thought it was good and organized. And, and then you didn't stick was, with the system. I did not. I, <laughs> I, I mean, it's it's hard. You know, you pull out bottles yeah. a, a, a night where you have people over and you're enjoying discipline. them. And yeah, exactly. And then you put them back in a different place or you, you're trying to go for a bottle that's in the back and you pull out three to get to it and you rush yep. to put those back. And so it's just, you know, it's malignantly kind of gotten where it is now and I haven't really kept up with either my inventory or my structure for yeah. organization. So yes, I'm very due for it. Um, and I like your idea. I do I do think that's a cool uh, kind of concept. I've, I've done by country kind of in the past where mm-hmm. I've kind of kept certain things in their uh, country of origin uh, range. And, yep. and that's that's worked nicely, but I don't know if I've outgrown that at this point or if I need to start rethinking what I'm doing. So yeah, I'm, I'm interested to hear what people are talking about and let us know how you do it. And maybe we can glean some uh, some interesting things from there as well. Yeah, uh, I love to glean things. Um, <laughs> one other small thing I did was all of the bottles that were more than halfway gone, most of yeah. which only have a little bit left. I put those at the front because yeah. it's like I need I need these to be prioritized so I could just get through them because I we talked about this before. We both have a tendency to when a bottle, especially a good bottle, mm-hmm. gets down low. It, it's almost like you don't want to finish it because you want a little bit left to Favorite. as like yeah. a reference to remember what it's exactly. like to compare right. it to stuff and right and yeah so I I I put the ones that are low volume at the front of the cabinet. My goal right. is to knock some of those out in the coming weeks and clear out some space because yeah. you know rum's there for drinking. There's no point in holding on to it forever, especially after it's been opened and you know there's that much volume that's gone from the bottle and everything so yeah and that totally makes sense too there's the whole conversation of how long does it last as it goes lower and lower volume in the bottle the less and less you're going to get that original kind of taste and flavor profile from it over time so yeah there's a there's a whole lot to it uh will i have something to talk about that's far less fun than that okay um well that's an excellent transition and way to sell (laughs) than what you're about to say (laughs) but interesting nonetheless and okay. I, I, I'm really like kind of this is uh, I, I will say a uh, front load this. This is a bit weird, um, <laughs> but I want to see if I'm alone in this or if okay. there's some rum person out there who can get on our social media and write in that they've experienced this as well. Very, very vulnerable just, right now. If I'm just ridiculous. Okay. So I this week uh, I visited the dentist. Will okay. I had to go in to have a crown put on. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's the first time I've ever done this. Have you ever had a crown put on? I have not, no. Okay, well, you're a lucky man, because it's, you know, it's not fun. It's not it's root not, canal bad. It's not great, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, they're in there for a while, and they're doing their thing, but essentially... They really this try is... to make it sound good, don't they? You're getting <laughs> yeah. a crown. Yeah, exactly, right? You're getting crowned. <laughs> but, so, the crown part of the tooth, I guess they shave off your existing tooth down <laughs> to, and then they cap on, yeah. like, a, a, a synthetic piece that kind of acts as what Can you hear that, so, like, drill, uh, you know? Exactly. Ugh. So... As as the dentist is in there, and you know I'm I'm back, and he's drilling away at this tooth, and of course it's numbed, so there's not like a whole lot of pain there. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't numb to the point where you know I can still like kind of taste everything, like yeah, it still works. Yeah, and so he's drilling, he's drilling in there, and I'm getting this. You flavor. can feel the particles like kind of like shooting off. Well, they they had like a a, a suction thing in there that was doing a good job oh, at man. getting the particles. Okay. So I hate I was all thankful. that stuff. I'm getting like yeah. like you know <laughs> dramatic flashbacks right now. We're, let's just we're let's going, move on. We're, yeah, I was gonna say we're going way too in depth into yeah. this, but but the whole point is I'm getting this flavor as he's doing this, and I'm like, what is that? It's it's not what I would describe as a good flavor, but it's also mm-hmm. not not terribly unpleasant. <laughs> And it's pungent for sure. Uh-huh. And I'm like, what is this flavor? And I keep keep getting waves of it, and my mind drifts into like tasting. What is this exactly? And then it it came to me. Okay, I got. I I, sh- I shit you not. I got a Coroni vibe <laughs> from well, so whatever what, was going on in my mouth at the dentist. What what aspect of it is it? Like the kind of diesely type type the, notes. Almost that I would describe it almost as a. a that rubber-like 
note or petrol okay. also that note i don't know if this was from like the drill uh-huh. drilling under my teeth and like what's coming off of that if i've had too much corona to drink maybe recently the dentist gloves. in my teeth uh, maybe i don't <laughs> dude i don't know latexy is is a right way to describe it I wasn't literally tasting his fingers or anything, but yeah. like you know that that kind of flavor is coming in. I'm like, damn, that's that's a Coroni flavor. Wow! So and next time so, you're writing tasting notes or something for a Coroni, you can put dental procedure. Trip, trip to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyhow, I want to know, seriously, am I super weird? Has anybody else ever experienced this who is, has uh, had a Coroni? And if they are getting what I'm getting, or am I just the, the weirdest person ever? So, I'm going to go ahead and, and just answer for everyone. You are the weirdest <laughs> person ever. No one else has, has ever thought that. And I'm not expecting any messages or emails or, or anything related to oh, that. Oh, so. p- please, someone prove Will wrong, please. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, well, on, yeah. on, on that note, uh, I, I know we, we talked an awful lot about Coroni in our last episode with Stefan Meyer. Uh, there's, there's a little bit, this isn't a Coroni-centric episode, but one of the cool things about Bristol Classic Rum and our interviewee on this episode, John Barrett, he was among that first group of people who really bought a lot of aged Coroni mm-hmm. rum around the time of the closure and was kind of in that first wave along with Luca and, and Velier and in releasing some of those bottlings. And so we, we got kind of another blast from the past of what it was like to, I think he said it was the largest investment they had ever made. If I'm remembering correctly, I might be phrasing it exactly, but it was like a mm-hmm. very large investment for them at a time to buy this cache of Coroni rum that they were getting. And that was fascinating to me, making one of your biggest bets ever on something that it's like, yeah. well, this is pretty weird. Yeah. <laughs> and like, All the chips are in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so this episode is full of kind of like really cool stories like that. As you said in the introduction, John and Bristol have been around. They've been in the rum game since the 90s. And to me, it's always so interesting just to hear about that time period and what the rum landscape looked like at the time. He's been in rum distilleries all over the world. We talked a lot about what areas, what rum producing countries he thinks are really interesting and we might be seeing a lot more of in the future. He's got his own perspective on uh, bottling strength. There's, yeah. uh, I think a lot of people will get a kick out of, uh, out of that segment because one of Bristol's things, most the vast majority of their releases are un- under 50% ABV, right. and that's uh, very much by design uh, to John's tastes. And so he talks a lot about why that is. And yeah, just a, a really interesting conversation. I think, you know, we're trying to get a little bit more of a window into some of these uh, European independent bottlers that have been around for a really long time that we don't necessarily see as much of in the United mm-hmm. States, yeah. but that have had a big impact on the rum landscape over the past few decades. And I do think we'll increasingly hopefully see more and more of them over here. So, you know, the vast majority of of those releases that we miss out on over here will hopefully one day be on, on this side of the pond, as they say, but yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to people hearing this. And uh, if you're ready, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and cut over to the interview. Let's jump on it. here with John Barrett, the man behind Bristol Spirits and Bristol Classic Rum. John, I was going through, I, you know, I was reading up on, on Bristol Spirits and rums that you've put out over the years and things like that before the interview, and I came across a review from last year, actually. It was, it was actually right about a year ago. It was June 2021. It was from a friend of the podcast, Lance Suraj Bali, writing for thelonecaner.com. And he mentioned that he was he was writing up on a Mauritius rum that you had released. And he mentioned that he called 
he just picked up the phone and called Bristol Spirits, like whatever number was out there. And it was you who picked up the phone on the <laughs> other end, which was, <laughs> so you know, I think kind of a delight to him. And it was surprising to me to read that, you know, you just pick up the phone, uh, dial the number in and, uh, you know, John Barrett, the, the man behind the company, picks up the phone. So I wanted to ask, is are, are you in the habit of picking up the phone? Is that like a, a, an everyday occurrence for you? Or was that just a case of being in the right place at the exact right time? Well, I think he was lucky. I was in the right, <laughs> at the right time, and and we're a very small company, and we we multitask. I so, love it. If, if there's a phone ringing more than about three times, and nobody else picks it up, I do. <laughs> you kind of you kind of pick it up and glare around the room a little bit, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I, you know, it could be an order. You never know. That's, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> So in in the spirit of that, um, obviously you've you've got a lot going on. You know, I was perusing the 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 Bristol Rum website today. I think you've got what, maybe close to to twenty rums, kind of in your uh, your your current portfolio of releases out there. I know you've got new ones coming down the the pike. So what's uh, what's been keeping you busy? Uh, you know, the last few months. What what are you working on right now? That's that's exciting well, to you. Everything is keeping us busy at the moment, to be absolutely honest, because, as you know, I mean, the company's been going for some time now, since 1993. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I've managed it with a small and very dedicated team. I've got guys and girls who've worked with me for 20 years, etc. put up with me for that long in the funny way I do business, etc. And then we've been joined by Simon, who's a go-getting guy who is taking over all the sales side. And he's also the one who is tech friendly, and I'm not. I mean, all I can do is do an email with two fingers, and that's about as far as I get. <laughs> okay, you, right now, you're on Zoom. You're doing yeah. great. You know, the video looks good. The audio sounds good. You're, you're doing a great job. That is all thanks to Simon. He is a tech <laughs> wizard at our company now, and he is leading sales and he's leading, you know, redesigning labels and packaging and all these sorts of things experience he's gathered elsewhere and he's brought to the company having joined us last year which is really exciting and he's really you know supercharging what we're doing wow because we've we've been doing this sort of steady bottling of things i like for the last 20 years and mm -hmm. we supply people around the world who think either we're, we're, we're totally daft or they actually <laughs> quite like what we're doing and, and, and we, we have some very dedicated customers who have been with us on this journey for the last 20 years. And they say to us, John, what on earth are you doing this for? Or what on earth do you do about that? Or, wow, that's wonderful. <laughs> it just really does depend. You need, you need like-minded enthusiasts to carry the message forward. Mm -hmm. You know, we have no... Um, enormous marketing operation behind us. We have no limitless budget to go and do A and P and things like that. It's totally word of mouth and totally friendships and people I've known over the years who've helped on the way. And and some people have been incredibly kind and incredibly generous with their time and effort. And here we are today. Yeah. On that note of kind of the amount of time you've been around, I think you started bottling rum in the '90s. So you, you've you've been in this for a while now. You know, I would say before kind of the you know in the last decade or so, there's been kind of a big uptick in higher end rum and things like that. I was interested in knowing just what to you have been the biggest differences in finding and sourcing rums now versus back in the '90s when you were first getting into it. Well, forgive me, I'm, I'm much older than you are, but forgive, forgive me going back even further. Because oh, please. I, sure. Yeah. Because I come from a family who've been in the drinks trade for about the last three generations. Oh, wow. Pubs and bars and hotels, and that's all on the on-trade side of things. And I formed my first company in 1973. Okay. And we took that on to become the Bristol Brandy Company. Mm-hmm because I was very interested in cognac and friends of mine in Bristol when I was doing my trade exams. I mean, I passed my diploma in 72. I, I'm convinced I couldn't pass diploma today. It's a much more <laughs> difficult examination. Is it the but, cognac? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but we, we specialized in early landed vintage cognac, which is cognac 
shipped from France to the UK for maturation. So I, I struck up a relationship with Hein Cognac in particular, and Bernard Hein is, became one of my dearest and closest friends, and also my mentor in all things spirituous, mm. really. He was a great teacher and a great enthusiast. Great. Sadly, he is no longer with us. But oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. But 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 over the years, we developed this relationship, and we represented Hein for early landed vintage cognac in the UK. We imported and then sold it to all the main leading wine merchants in London, all the well-known names, etc. And that's really what set me on the way on the spirit market. And then we finally sold the company to Hein, who at that time were part of LVMH, Louis Vuitton Mode Hennessy. Mm, okay. so we joined LVMH as the sort of cognac specialist division and stayed with them for some years. And then in 93, we decided, two of us, that we want to move out of that. I'm not a great corporate animal, but <laughs> LVMH is the most wonderful company. And, and if you are a corporate animal, it's an amazing place to be. It has such intellectual quality. It has such technical resource. It has such financial banking. I mean, it is just quite a remarkable. And, and for somebody from a, a small company background, to be launched into this international company was an amazing experience. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we left them in 93 on very good terms, and we kept them as customers for many years. And um, I started off continuing cognac work, not only with Hein, but with Delamar as well, and with one or two other brands. And then I was joined by a dear friend called Wallace Milroy. And Milroy is in London in Greek Street, used to have one of the most famous malt whiskey outlets in London. Oh, okay. And he came on and said, John, have you looked at whiskey? I said, well, I know nothing about whiskey. Unfortunately, he did. So he did some whiskey work. He then introduced me to Bill Thompson, who was the, for some time, the, the distillery manager at Springbank. Oh, cool. And, and Bill said, well, hello, nice to meet you. I have a chatter, chatter. In a previous life, he had been sales manager for Heineken, the beer people in the Caribbean. Oh, wow. Okay. And he said, well, I sold a lot of beer in the Caribbean, but I also know where there's a lot of rum. Ah, okay. It's coming together have now. You, have you thought of doing anything in rum? I said, well, I know absolutely nothing about rum. So he said, well, we'll teach you, you know, and we'll, we'll start doing this. So we did. And then I met Ben Cross, who was the managing director of the main rum company in Liverpool. Yeah. And we struck up a jolly relationship. And so in about 95, 96, we started bottling rum for our own label and for a, a very prestigious account in Japan with uh, Tanaka-san, who, who has the company called Japan Imports, okay. who, who are and still are one of the leading importers of spirit into Japan. So mm -hmm. rum, whiskey, et cetera. So we were doing some business there, and it's just grown since then. And I mean, we have customers all over the world. I mean, Australia and China and most of Europe, Scandinavia, Canada, where we don't have much actually is in the USA. I know, yeah. yeah. We're hoping to talk to you about that. <laughs> exactly. <by the> <laughs> that's, that's coming later. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so this business has just grown on its own volition with the help of friends. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, so when you're, you know, around mid 90s, you're first getting into rum, you meet some people, obviously, main rum company, kind of a, a great person to shepherd you along in your in your rum journey. Do you remember how, how do you go from I don't know anything about the spirit category to I want to get into this? And, and then how do you go about sort of selecting what you're going to bottle first. Do you, do you remember the what the first rums were that you did bottle and sell? Yes. I mean, firstly, you have to have the commercial input in that, you know, I buy it for X and I can sell it for Y. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, that, if that doesn't work, there's no point in doing any of it. So <laughs> you've got to start from there. And secondly, you can only work with what's available. Mm -hmm. Now, main rum were very good in saying, well, John, you know, we do have some sort of interesting stock because they were very closely working with Demerara Distillers of Guyana. Right. So our first operations really were 
Port Morant, the sales, uh, Diamond, mm -hmm. etc. All the classic Demerara distillers rums. Right. So our earliest bottlings were things like Port Morant, 86. Not a bad uh, place to start, right? Absolutely right. <laughs> so we, we started doing this and, and it literally, it just grew from there. So now thinking about that, the 20 years now that you've had Bristol now, and the, it sounds like 20 years of experience prior to that as well. How do you now approach what you're releasing with rum? And does that differ? Because you also do, as you mentioned, now whiskey and cognac still. So does, does rum differ as a spirit category for how you approach what you're going to release now from those other categories? The same quality criteria apply to all the spirits we deal in. One, it's going to be good. And right. two, I have to like it. Because <laughs> if, but, but if you cannot buy it with conviction... You cannot sell it with conviction. Yeah. So you have to like what you're buying. And experience shows you over the years that if you buy new make spirit, whether it's cognac, whether it's rum, whether it's whiskey, and you treat it properly, you put it into the right wood, you store it in the correct warehousing, and you look at its development regularly, you get to that sweet spot of where you feel you're able to offer something out, which is really rather nice right and it doesn't have to be the oldest it doesn't have to be the most expensive mm -hmm. you can have perfectly nice young six seven eight year old rum oh yeah which will fill a category which is absolutely you know ready for easy drinking pleasant drinking etc i mean we are inundated by people who say oh yes well we'd like to buy rum from you but it has to be at least 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, thank you, guys. That's really nice. You should have come to see us 20 years ago <laughs> and bought it then and keep it to yourself. You know, what do you think we've been doing for the last 20 years? Mm -hmm. And we have always rolled all our sort of profits and what have you back into stock. I'm a great believer in stock building, stock holding. I mean, we have a, a lot of stock sitting in bulk gradually coming through, but it is, it's a 10, 12, 15 year cycle. Mm, right. Uh, you know, we, we've been buying, we've got New Make Jamaica that's just come in, which will go to wood and won't come out till after I'm gone, I suspect. So I will have to sell it later on. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, we, we've also, we released some Long Pond 1985 in this last bottling. Right. Wow. Which we bought years ago for not a lot of money. But having kept it over the years, it's improved in quality. It's reduced in volume. We've had all the expenses of storage and mm -hmm. samples and analysis and all these sorts of things to go with it. And then we get around to, to finally bottling it and selling it. In fact, I, I've got some here. Yes, oh, here we oh. are. Long, long Pond 85. If I, I can, I can show you that. Oh, Go man. I can almost smell that through Zoom. <laughs> you can smell it you can through Zoom, can you? Right. Yeah. Well, there we are, you see. I mean, and it, it's just flown. And it, this is, I know, a thousand pounds a case now, and it's all gone. Yeah. And people, yeah. We, we have it on, on you know, allocation because we only do distribution through our distributors. So we don't do any online sales. We mm -hmm. don't do any retail. We're not licensed to do retail or anything like that. I'm a great believer in having one distributor per country. So we have you know, one in France, one in Germany, one in Sweden, one here. That explains and, why you're not in the U.S. Yeah, yet. exactly. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but that's, that's how I like to do business. And we do business with our customer, our distributor. And they are the specialists in knowing all the best liquor stores in Helsinki or in Stockholm or in mm -hmm. Berlin or wherever it is. And that's the formula we've always worked on. So we've had to allocate this, this long pond 85 saying, well, you can have two cases each, you know, yeah, I just, I pulled up the, uh, the information sheet that you have on that rum on your website. And it says that it arrived in the UK in 1997. So that, that must be wow. pretty rewarding to be able to think back to rum coming in that long ago and now yeah. being able to put it on the market and see it, you know, just fly out like that. 
Well, it is. I mean, you know, rum is following malt whiskey, but mm. 25 years behind. And if you look at the pricing, if you look at the packaging, if you look at the development of super quality malt whiskey and, and the amazing marketing hype, which we have none of, but all the great big companies have, I mean, it's amazing. You look at stuff at three, four, five, eight, ten thousand pounds and more a bottle. Mm -hmm. And there is a market there. And rum is following that. I, I find the rum category most exciting because it covers all parts of the market. I, I'm a great believer in, in the rum pyramid. And <laughs> what is, what is the rum pyramid? Right. The rum pyramid is you start at the bottom with the easy drinking, big brands, and you think of things like spiced rum. Mm -hmm. Captain Morgan spiced rum, 10, 15 million cases in the U.S. market. Right. You look at Bacardi. I have the greatest respect for Bacardi. I mean, they have supported the rum category for the last 60 or 70 years. And to be able to produce 15, 20 million cases a year of consistently fine product, you know, it is, is a remarkable feat in itself. They also have the ability to pull in stock, which they've been aging for ages. And people are very sniffy about sort of, you know, oh, it's only rum and coke and things like that. But rum is a drink to be enjoyed. Mm. It is a social pastime. It is a drink. What's wrong with a rum and coke by the side of the swimming pool when you're lying down at three o'clock in the afternoon right. thinking, well, this is quite nice. Life right. is quite good and the sun is shining. Yeah. What Nothing as long as you don't use that Long Pond 85 to do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. So the, the joy of rum is there's a rum for every drinking opportunity. And as you come up the pyramid, sure, you can come to more exciting things, right. you know, eight-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds. And as you graduate, get up to the top, you can get up to, you know, bottles at auction, which go for thousands and thousands of pounds. That is the, 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 the joy for me. But when I do tastings, when I do lectures and what have you, I always like to remind people it is a drink for enjoyment. Mm. Normally, yep. Yep. normally when we finish, because if you do a tasting, people get very thirsty. And, and towards the end, I normally always serve a rum and tonic water or a rum and ginger ale and ice and as you know, a long drink. Yeah. yeah. For me... That is the social part of it. If you go back to cognac, I mean, years ago, we used to be drinking cognac and Perrier water. Mm. You know, cognac and brandy and soda, effectively, because you you cannot keep drinking neat spirits all the time. Yeah. And this is one of the arguments I have with some very keen enthusiasts and some very keen bloggers and some very <laughs> keen rum and spirit enthusiasts who say, oh, but you know, we we must we must taste it. We must smell it. We wanted it cask strength, and, and, and you know you spend all our time sniffing it. That is not what the drink is all about. <laughs> we spend all our time sniffing it. I like that. Yeah, yeah. We, um. you know, the drink is for social enjoyment to, to share with your friends and relax with, etc. So that's my mission, which is drink it with your favorite mixer, but not the wrong bond. Yeah, not the not the eighty five long pot. <laughs> Um, no, I, I like that. And, uh, it's, it's, it's a good reminder because I mean, there, you know, there'll be, a, it'll be a hot summer day. It was actually, it just passed. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. It just passed a hundred degrees here uh, for the first time in like a decade. So it's been hot. And so there's some days when, um, you know, I love drinking rum neat. That's what I usually do. That's what I'm doing right now. But mm -hmm. sometimes you just want, like you said, like a long drink that's cold, oh. that's got ice that still has flavor. And so, um, having some of those in your uh, in your rotation is is essential to me. But I want to. You basically got in on rum pretty early, uh, and I think I'm sure you've noticed more than others. There have been more and more kind of independent bottlers and stuff like that getting into rum, or you know, just starting and focusing on rum from the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, over the last decade or so, how how do you continue to kind of separate yourself as there's more and more companies coming to the scene that in, in many ways are after some of the same types of products that you are. Uh, I wanted to ask just what makes a Bristol rum, a, a Bristol rum in your eyes, other, other than you think it's good and you like it? Well, 
I think it's good and I like it, is the first barometer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, because if I don't like it, well, we have to dispose of it in some way or we don't <laughs> buy it. It's the other option, you know. Yeah. But let's assume I do like it. It is nice and we have bought it. Well, then I need to nurse it through to its its development stage. So we can then say, rather like uh, we've got an eight-year-old Trinidad we've just released. Now, people say, oh, it's only eight years old. But actually, it's really nice, light, pleasant drinking. It's ideal for mixing with your, your favorite mixer or the rest of it. And I see nothing wrong with that. And within its, within its place within that pyramid, it actually stands out quite proud and quite mm-hmm. happily. You know, here I am, an eight-year-old, but actually <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm quite nice drinking, you know. And, and that, I think, is important. What I've seen over the years is, of course, there have been the great traditional companies, uh, particularly in Scotland, the Gordon McPhails, mm-hmm. William Head, uh, which is, again, a Springbank associate, I mean, which, which have been traditional rum bottlers. And although we think of Scotland as a, as a Scotch whiskey market, it's actually a big spirits market for rum, for dark rum, which I know is, a, is an unfashionable style at the moment, but trawler rum and OVD and things like this, which are deeply colored. Mm-hmm. But that is a traditional market. And there are also big vodka drinkers up there as well. Oh, really? And in general, they're big drinkers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but we've also seen a lot of people from other parts of Europe, uh, smaller companies who want to get into the rum scene, and they're saying, oh, well, we've developed a spiced rum, and we're going to market this, and then we're going to add on to our range and things like that. Well, fine. I mean, we obviously sell bulk rum as well as selling bottled rum. Hmm. I mean, I have to say, all all the best bulk we keep for ourselves, hmm. <laughs> uh, which is which is the philosophy of our range. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, we have these sort of Karenias, we have old Guyanas, we have old Jamaicas, etc. And I, I'm really, I have no intention and desire to sell those. You know, we don't need to sell them to other people in bulk. So we're keeping those for ourselves. Mm-hmm. But I'm quite happy to trade sort of 10-year-olds up to 10 years old, 12-year-old maybe, but that's sort of pitch, which allows a few other people to start to develop their own range. And there are some very nice people involved in the rum business. Sure. And I think it's very much a people business. And if I if I warned the people, I warned the rum, as it were, and, and we do business together. And again, we've had some customers for the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years we supply. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're not the cheapest, we're not the easiest, we're not, you know, we work with friends, various suppliers, and obviously with Main Rum as well, who are good friends as well. And uh, we, you know, we're happy to encourage the whole sector because the rum sector has grown over the last 10, 12, 15 years, has grown tremendously. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the moment, rum is hot, as it were. We've seen gin go up, we've seen vodka go up, and and, and they plateau, and and rum is actually going along at the moment on a pretty good pitch, because what it has is variety within the category. Go back to the pyramid again. You can have easy, light, white Cuban rums. You can have rums from Venezuela, that Latino style, which is actually really quite attractive. Mm-hmm. You can have all the sort of classic, Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica. Uh, I've got some Barbados here from, from Richard, from Richard Seal. I mean, you know, this is 2011 dis- dis- distillation. It's, you know, 10, 11 years old. It's lovely, lovely drinking. Mm-hmm. He, yeah. he, makes, he makes the most lovely Barbados rum. It yeah. has that slight, touch of, that slight touch of tar on the nose, which I find very attractive. I say that to people, they think I'm mad, but <laughs> I actually I actually love when they're relaying the road surface. Or well, you've also people, bottled um, Caroni, so, I mean, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yep, that's so true. But, but those sort of um, 
guitar-like qualities I find really quite attractive and very typical of Barbados. But Caroni, sorry, you mentioned Caroni. I'm sure we've been busy with that as well. Yeah, I think we we actually wanted to ask about that. But since I have the opportunity, before we get to that, maybe you mentioned rum being kind of the next big thing in the spirits world, uh, or has been. I think in the U.S., maybe we're maybe a little bit behind, is what it feels like in that regard, at least from where I'm sitting. But I have seen, like you have said, a, a trend, and uh, that we feel like rum is is growing, and it's going to be the next big thing here as well. Here every year. But but bear in mind, you've got bourbon. Yeah. We do, and you've got tequila. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, if you look at the tequila side and the sales of tequila, I mean, you know, it's it's enormous volume in the market, which is is quite a quite a sort of you know competitor as far as rum is concerned. And bear in mind also, you've got the U.S. tax situation where where <laughs> yeah. Puerto Rico you know has a great tax advantage, yeah. whereas Virgin all Islands the rest well. of the Caribbean have you know problems with pricing and what have you. But I think with really good quality and really serious product you could overcome. Gotcha. So you think uh, e- even here, rum is going to have its moment then? I think so. I mean, we supply Canada, customers in Canada, in Quebec, in Ontario, etc. And they seem to have no problem selling the stuff. And yeah. I, th- I think given we have had several attempts at selling in the States, mostly in California on the West Coast, and one of my dearest friends from long ago is Daryl Corty in Sacramento. Corty Brothers in Sacramento, who are one of the most amazing delicatessen and oh, really? wine. Yeah, wine and spirit stores. Hmm. Just, go- just Google up Corty Brothers Sacramento. Yeah, you see what I'll I'm do that. About. And we have shipped um, high ester Wedderburn rum to Daryl. And he's as bonkers as I am, you know, we like these sort of way out wacky things. And so we've done work with him over the years. In fact, I'm just sending him some samples now. So we might do some special bottlings for him. Of course, it's always had to be in 750s and things like that. But fortunately, yeah. that yeah. seems to be easing a little bit. Right. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, not necessarily anymore. I'm actually, exactly. I've, I've started to see here and there a few 700 ml or yep. 70 cl uh, bottles yeah. on, on shelves here. Yep. That would be great news because why on earth we had to have two sizes years ago? Lord only knows. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably our fault. It probably is. You're right. (laughs) Uh, Well, hey, it sounds like you've got California on your mind. I would just say that the the strategy here for the United States should be hit up the the East Coast maybe as well. Maybe a little (laughs) Florida, maybe a little New York. Forget about Tennessee. Don't worry about Tennessee. John's in Miami. I'm in Miami, yeah. (laughs) Let's get it over here. Um, Well, Miami has a great sort of Cuban diaspora, and and I would imagine the whole Cuban style of rum. I forget you that. All the politics of Havana. Club. I was going to say, if we could get it here, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> um, but but yeah, we have. I mean, there's a there's a definitely a burgeoning rum scene that's continuing here, and I'm happy for that. But it'd be made even better with more. So bring bring it on, John. We 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 definitely I, would take it here. Um, right. I wanted to ask a little bit more about uh, the, the upper part of the pyramid, uh, the rum pyramid, maybe, uh, and how that aligns with some of what you're doing there, which is when I look at your website and I look at some of the rums you're releasing, I think a lot of it can be summed up by one single word, which is single. And that is to say you focus on single barrel, single estate, and or single still or a combination of those. Um, I, I think we, we, Will and I definitely understand that focus and get that, but maybe for those that listen and may not be as understanding of why those categories are important or interesting, could you talk a little bit more about why you've made that a focus and what makes it special? Well, if you, go, if you start with Guyana and Demerara Distillers, Guyana used to be a, 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 a country with numerous distil- uh, distilleries, yeah. right. and they've all sadly gone. They're, now, all the actual kit has gone back to Diamond at Georgetown. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the variety of stills they have there, it's not a museum. It's a working distillation operation. So you can pull out, for instance, Fort Morant, these amazing wooden pot stills, yeah. which yeah. are steam-driven and produce really pungent, strongly flavored rums, which you can put down for a long time. And we've got a 1990, which we've stored in a port pipe mm. for God knows how long. Wow. I can't tell you, but a long time. And that's just come out. And that is of such 
concentration, depth, flavor, nose, and sort of drinking experience. It's it's right up at the top of the pyramid. You know, it's mm-hmm. expensive and all the rest of it. But it is a single example of a single still showing what can be done with good maturation, good wood, and hopefully, you know, good production, good technique, etc. Yeah. As far as single stills, absolutely fine. So you get the variety of the different productions. Port Morant and Versailles are two sets of wooden stills, but they are different. They're in the mm-hmm. same story, but they're different. Then go to single barrels. Well, we have done and we do do single barrel production. Where we have only a single barrel, you can only do a single barrel. <laughs> right. <laughs> Simplifies that, that, things. Like. Yeah. But actually, I quite like small batch bottling. Right. So you might have, say, five barrels of eight year old Trinidad, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which you actually blend together. Right. And you have a reduction run because, after all, you know, you've got to have enough stock to sell. Right. Because if you have, if you have distributors around the world and they all say, well, John, we'll have, you know, three, four, five hundred cases mixed, let's, let's send it down. It's no good saying, well, I've only got 23 of these, you know, I only got how many right. bottles, whatever. You've got to have stock to sell. Yeah. Then you have to do the A word, right? Allocating. <laughs> Allocating. <laughs> right. But the, the joy of small batch bottling is that you can blend the overall characteristics and assuming that obviously you're happy with each and every barrel that's going to go into that blend, mm-hmm. then you can have single, single still, but a small batch bottling. And I think that's the way to go forward because, you know, we need, small though we are, we need enough stock to sell. We're not in the Diageo stakes where, you know, you, <laughs> you could flat XD number of barrels yeah. and bottles. Etc. You're still right. answering the phone sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we're answering the right. phone. Yes. But you still need some volume. So small batch bottling, I'm a great enthusiast of. Yeah, I, I wish we would actually see a little bit more of that. That's something I do see in other spirit categories more often. So I, I agree. Well, and sometimes yeah. the the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts too. You know, when you com- combine those casts together. True. Did I say that expression right? That's one of those expressions that I'm always like, wait, did I say it the right way? You guys know what <laughs> I'm talking about, is. though. You did. Yes, you did. <laughs> and and the whole concept is right, because what we're not doing is leveling down. Right. We're, we are maintaining a level. Mm-hmm. And that's very important, I think. And whether it's rum, whiskey, cognac, or whatever it is, I think it's very important. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of that, actually, I'm a words guy. I think Will and I both are, are word people. And uh, I, I when I was guys. looking up, yeah, we're, we're into to <laughs> names and words, I guess, but uh, as well as rum. So I noticed on the website for your, your rum series is called the Bristol Classic Rum, right? And so classic is one of those words that might be uh, taken different ways or hard to distinguish. I wanted to ask you when you came up with that, what does classic mean to you and how do you apply it to those rums in, in your mind? Well, let me start with Bristol. Bristol is obviously where I was born and where we, as a company, operated from. So okay. Bristol City over on the West Coast. That makes it, sense. Yep. <laughs> that seems to be reasonable. Classic, um, we needed to actually define the name in some way. Because if you just had Bristol rum, ah. people would say, ah, well, what is Bristol rum? Is it made from in Bristol? Bristol? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's nothing so what we are looking for is a classic expression of the rum, of its type, from whence it came. So if it's from Guyana, is it a classic expression of Port Morant? Yeah. If it's yeah. from Jamaica, is it a Hamden? Is it a Money Musk? Is it a Long Pond? If it's from you know Fiji, is it a classic Fiji rum? Mm-hmm. Precious. Wherever it's, wherever it's coming from. Right, so it's indicative, is it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it a really good example that you could say, this is a, a, you know, a classic example of right. like, South African rum? Yeah, like if you have this Port Morant, you'll understand what a Port Morant is. Correct. Yeah. Mm. So that's, that's basically why we tagged the name that way. And we use the Bristol City coat of arms, an old one on the label. We have the strap line, all the rest, etc. Yeah, and it's it's just stuck with us over the years. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm a great believer if it works, don't change it. That's right. It's a it's a classic <laughs> John Barrett move, you might say. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. A, a, another thing that I think stood out to me when I was kind of looking over, you know, your output over the years and things, you've said in the past that you prefer rums that are between 43 to 48 percent ABV rather than cask strength, and, and most of your bottlings reflect that preference. And I think that that might be surprising to a lot of rum enthusiasts. You know, you you referenced earlier people clamoring for kind of cask strength stuff or kind of Mm -hmm. turning their nose up at at stuff that isn't cask strength. So I wanted to ask, you know, why do you prefer that strength range? And then how do you go about selecting that ideal bottle proof? Kind of what's your process for finding the perfect spot? Go back to what I was saying, you know, drink uh, rum is a drink. Yeah. You have to be able to drink it. Now, Drinking means you put it in your mouth and you swallow it. <laughs> you don't actually want to burn your mouth, your throat, <laughs> etc. And, and I'm very anti cask strength because with rum in particular, you could have cask strengths up into the 70s, 75, you know, into high 70s, nearing 80% vol. And to actually Put that out on the retail market, I think, is totally irresponsible Mm. of the producer. I think we have an obligation, one, to be sensible, two, to show the products in what we feel is their best or better presentation as far as the product is concerned. And thirdly, I don't go with this sort of macho oh, we must drink stronger and stronger. (laughs) Just because it's strong, it must be good. And that is not the case. Mm -hmm. Because what we all say is uh, take a splash of water with it, which effectively is reducing it. I know there are an awful lot of enthusiasts, and forgive me if I say, you know, slightly geeky, et cetera. (laughs) I think they don't have to that. Yeah. (laughs) But only want to be sniffing cast strength spirit because they feel they're getting more nuances of wood or fruit or esters or aldehydes, etc. out of it. That's fine, but relax. What you want, <laughs> ultimately, relax. ultimately you, you want something to put into that glass. Yeah. Which you're going to enjoy with a couple of lumps of ice and you're going to sit back with your friends and you're going to say, gee, life is good. And, <laughs> You know, that does not need 60, 70% alcohol. Mm-hmm. I, I honestly prefer that sort of mid range, 40, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, say between 40 and 50 as a, as a broad sure. brush. Mm-hmm. That's what I like personally. And that's how I like my rums to be seen. I have to say, we have done some higher strength bottlings for one or two people, but I'm really not keen on them. If you come back to the Caroni, which we were talking about in a moment, mm. I mean, we shipped a lot of that in, and it was a sort of, I know, 68, 65, 60 something. And some of those are still there. But to me, and it, this is a very personal thing, but to me, it is not a joy drinking them at that strength. I want to bring them down to, you know, 50 is enough alcohol for anybody. Mm-hmm. And that, I believe, gives more enjoyment. It's not a question of more bottles. That's not what I'm looking for. But it's more enjoyment and more perceived quality appreciation of what you're actually drinking. You do not need to be up in the high 60s or 70s simply because you think it's a jolly good thing to do. Mm. <laughs> oh, I, I, I like that you have a point of view because there's only so much that you can control as uh, an independent bottler. And, and obviously fair, you're, yeah. you're not just buying stuff and putting it straight into bottles. You know, you're doing a lot of aging things and stuff like that. But, you know, you have a point of view. It allows you to have sort of a consistent style and, and that sort of thing, which I respect. One thing I wanted to ask was when, when you're sort of evaluating maybe casks or something like that or you know, getting samples, do you evaluate a cask strength or do you always proof down a little bit? What's kind of your process there? Right. If we draw samples out, as we do, we, we have them sent down to us. And I'm looking at my tasting. I normally taste towards the end of the week, etc. I normally firstly taste on, well, I say taste, I firstly examine on the nose at whatever strength the samples come in at. So 
if they've come out of the cask at 60, 65, 50, 55, I will smell them, look at them, analyze the color, analyze the smell. I would then normally bring them down to about 40, 45. Okay. And then I'd often bring them down to about 25. Okay. I have a three-step tasting. And okay, you get your, your pipette, you get your water, and, and you can bring it down. Now, I'm, I'm not saying I'm within 0.1% of, you know, one degree of alcohol or anything. But Approximation. That is how I taste. So you start with the nose at full strength. You bring it down to sort of within roughly where you're going to bottle it. And then I like to bring it down again mm -hmm. to see if there are any faults, if there's any underlying uh, taints or smells mm -hmm. that you don't like and don't want. And that, assuming you meet positives all the way down, then we would say, well, I think this rum is looking attractive. I think on the plateau of maturation, remember you, you go up one side of the plateau, you go along the top, and eventually you start going down the other side because the spirit, whichever it is, whatever type of spirit, becomes mm -hmm. dominated by the wood. Right. And what we're not trying to do is to drink wood. <laughs> yeah. wood, wood is there as an instrument of maturation it is not I mean, it's desirable in small quantities but it is not a sort of primary flavor that you're actually looking to seek it's not the star uh, yeah it's not the star it's the fruit you want to maintain right and so fruit wood balance is very important right and so you you go along tasting tasting and you think right this looks really nice We'll bottle some of this and put it out in the market. You might well have further supplies of it maturing for a further period. Then, depending on how sales go, you either think, whoopee, that was great, we've sold the lot, or it's hanging around a bit and, you know, you think about this or that. And maybe then you come into a, a later version of the same rum mm. within that, that top of, of the, the, the plateau, what you don't want to do is go down the other end. So I think it's it's really important about wood management, and that's something I'm quite keen on, and we can talk about more detail later. But wood management is so important that when you when you have a profile of a rum style that you like, and if you take Port Moranz as an example, which is a big, beefy rum, it can carry wood for ages. But if you go to, say, Trinidad, Trinidad distillers produced lots of nice light rum, but mm -hmm. you don't want to overwhelm it with yeah. wood. You know, we're we're not here drinking once used bourbon wood. That's that's not what we want. We're not drinking vanilla. That's not what we want. If you want vanilla, go and buy some ice cream. <laughs> it's, it's 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 not the prime object of putting the stuff together. So I I normally do my tasting like that. So it's it's three stages. And then look horizontally across the stock. And it, it might be that, you know, we only have a few barrels of it left or, or it's the end of the stock or whatever it is. And obviously the commercial concerns come in as well. In our price list, does it fit within a certain price parameter? Do we need something that is lower priced, higher priced, different style, different, different geographical area? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we've got too many Jamaicas at the moment. Maybe we, we, we want something from the Indian Ocean, which is an area which I think has got so much potential producing mm, yeah, yeah. interesting rum. So, you know, maybe we should have something from Reunion or from Mauritius and and change the, 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 the list a little bit that way. Because one of the things, and it, it's a problem of our own success, I suppose, one of the things we're constantly asked is, well, what's coming next? Yeah. Right. What's, what's on the way? And you think, well, hang on, guys. Just whoa, 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 whoa. You know, we're not even sure about that, let alone telling you what we're going to bring yeah. out. Something. We'll strike that question from the end of our interview. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Delete. But it, it, it's, it's, it's part of the joy of what we do. And it is just fascinating to see how things change. And, Wood manage. I, I talk about wood management to bore people to death with, but it's so fascinating if you put spirit into different wood to start with. Do you use once used bourbon? Right. Well, 
that's fine, but it's really in your face. And often it's too much. So do you then use it second, third, fourth time? Well, the trouble with bourbon wood is that it's it's cut and sawed when it, the barrels are produced. So the the veins of the wood have been cut through. Hmm. So your rate of evaporation, your lossage and storage is actually higher hmm. than putting it into split French wood or split hogsheads, huh. where the, the timber has been split down the grain and you bend it. And so the, 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 there aren't the capillaries that, that are not going through from side to side of the wood. Whereas if you machine cut, you literally go straight through the wood. Now, the reason why it's done in the US is, is because obviously the barrel making union after prohibition wanted to have a lot of barrels made and keep a lot of jobs. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But it means you do get a different maturation profile and a different lossage profile of the stock. So that's one thing. And then, of course, the second thing is where you actually warehouse. Yeah. If you warehouse in Tennessee and you've got, you know, a six stack of barrels of pallets vertically, mm -hmm. and the top one under the tin roof is the one that gets cooked. So you get you get not only toasted and roasted up there, but but the evaporation rate is so much yeah, higher as mm -hmm. well. Right. So you've got you've got to bring that down when you start to think about blending and bottling, and, and you have to think about well, what's been the financial lossage of that, mm. what's been the extraction out of the wood, how do I blend that further down with other stock? Can we use the barrels of get because standing vertically, all the heads dry out. So you could only fill so far away as you've got lossage. And that's really quite interesting. And, and of course, the other thing is at what strength do you fill? Right. Because tannin, which is what you're looking to extract from the wood, is water soluble. It's not spirit soluble. So if you actually fill at a lower strength, you actually eke out some of these more complex, more interesting tannins, which is what gives the individuality the the style, the quality, the inputs into the actual spirit that's inside. So all of these things come into play before you even go to where is your warehouse? Is it in Scotland on the west coast where it's wet and cold and foggy? And you know, the, the humidity is is so high and the temperature is so low. What does that do to the maturation over 10 years by comparison with the same rum? 10 years in Barbados or yeah. 10 years in Guyana or 20 years. Of course, the trouble is in the Caribbean, if you left it for 20 years, you'd have hardly anything left in the barrel. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah. The evaporation rate is so high. Mm -hmm. so all of these things come into play. And then you look at well, what happens if you use European wood, you use French oak, you use Limousin, you use Trance. You look at woods from various, various countries various different types of oak, different types of wood, some better than others. I mean, there are companies in Europe which specialize in supplying, I don't know, 20 or 30 different types of wood. Mm -hmm. You don't actually want all of them. You, you only want those that actually work for your particular products. Right. And, you know, I wouldn't put rum into chestnut, for instance. Now, we, we imported Armenian brandy years ago in Armenian oak which was fine. So we, we had, had, once we bottled it out, we had the Armenian oak barrels and we put stuff into them. Didn't actually work very well. But I mean, those are the experiences you learn over the years as to what yeah. well, what way. What, what do you do in that case when something, oh, these Armenian oak barrels turned out to not be so great? Well, that, that actually is a problem then. You then have to find a volunteer customer who will take it off your hands. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, these... I, I, we 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 are not a hundred percent successful. We know we make mistakes. I make mistakes. You put the wrong thing in the wrong wood, keep it for too long. You think that was a really good idea. It doesn't work out. Yeah. Sometimes, hopefully, not too often, but sometimes it does happen. I actually wanted to ask about that a little bit. So obviously, your practical experience has helped you to figure out how you marry the right rums with the right wood and barrels. But how do you now go about using that experience? I mean, do you have a hidden equation somewhere that you write down a bunch of the variables and try to figure it out? Or do you just kind of do it by feel and say, well, I have these barrels and I think this rum would go well in there? Is there 
a process you have? Uh, not really. I think you described it pretty well a moment ago. It's by the, by the seat of your pants, really. Instinct, baby. <laughs> Instinct. It's by experience. It's, you know, I knew this wood will work well with because I've done it before. Mm. And, you know, you buy wood from trusted suppliers. And, you know, we, we buy bourbon wood, so I, I'm not knocking it. That's not what I'm saying. But yeah. You want to use it with restraint because – what I don't want is is the rum totally overpowered by tasting like bourbon. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you might you might as well go and drink bourbon. Right, yeah. right. And there's nothing wrong with bourbon. Let me say, I you know, I, I, again, I'm not knocking that, but yeah. it, it it is a different flavor. Yeah, a different style, and, and you can also use barrels over and over again until you actually becoming they become exhausted, and you think, well, that's no good. We get rid of them. But actually, they have a they have a purpose in life, which is to allow oxidation to allow development without very much wood input into right. it. Which means that if you do have some barrels of the same rum, obviously, uh, which have become over bourbonized, say for a moment, <laughs> you can again in small batch bottlings you can blend back different woods of the same spirit, the same age, all the rest of it. And come back to what you think or what I think is what I want to show in my room. Right. So you might put, you know, six of these and three of those or two of one and six of the other or whatever the formula is. Yeah. yeah. It's very much a tasting thing. And mm -hmm. I don't know. I do it by taste and feel. I think basically I have no magic formula. I have no magic machine that says, <laughs> and I know obviously the big companies have, you can do an enormous amount of, technical analysis and if you're producing johnny walker black and you've got to make you know 10 million bottles a year you obviously can't do it my way right you've got right. to be really really properly <laughs> really carefully really scientifically and they do an absolutely wonderful wonderful job yeah. when you think you're going to do 10 million bottles of consistently the same quality the same style throughout the world and, and it goes out to the market i mean that is a great art. And I mean, one or two friends who are blenders over the years, people like David Stewart Grants or, or one or two others, you know, who have this ability to bring together different different age spirits, different spirits, different distilleries to make up a consistent blend. So from different inputs, you make a consistent output. That is a great, great skill that I don't really have. I mean, Doing what I do, single casks are easy. You know, it's a one off, that's the cask. Right. Small batch yeah. bottling, more interesting. Uh, we don't normally do anything more than about 20 barrels maximum as a, as a bottling. And, and that's as far as we can go, because that's the limit of my technical ability, experience, what have you. But I have the greatest admiration for those boys who can go out and do and have done consistently for yeah. years constructing blends of popular whiskies which go around the world you know and, and do yeah. an amazing job. Yeah. it's a different different ball game um, ball game. we we've we've made references to coroni throughout the the conversation so far and i, I want to talk about that a little bit we just the interview we did before yours was with stefan meyer i don't know if you've you've talked with stefan but he just wrote the, um, the book yeah the book mm -hmm. on coroni mm -hmm. and all the bottlings and everything uh, and so, you know, just having that fresh in our brain and, and knowing that you were in on Coroni pretty early on, I wanted to ask a little bit about just your experience of that. And what I was really curious about is just, do you remember the moment that you first found out about Coroni and, you know, what was your first experience with the distillery? And if you could kind of take us back in time and, and through the experience right. of, you know, purchasing some of those casks after it closed. I, as I said earlier on, we've always been great friends of Maine Rum. Yeah. And Ben Cross, who was the managing director of Maine Rum, and I went out to the Caribbean in 2001, leading a small group of trade people visiting different distilleries. And obviously in Trinidad, we went to Angostura. Mm -hmm. We also went to Caroni. And this is so, right around the closure, right? Yeah, well, 2001 was just before. Uh -huh. It closed about 2004 as far as distillation was concerned. Okay. Although a very long closure period as far as 
the stock and the company and all the rest of it. And, and Ben said, we must come and look at this. They make some amazing rum. Trouble is, they have no idea how to market it. Mm. And they were producing under the auspices of the Trinidad government. And um, I'm not, not, again, knocking anybody, but that's how it was done. And they could actually produce the volume of really interesting quality rum. They had these tall column stills. They had a small pot still. They had a, a, an aging distillery, which they really put no investment into. Hmm. And they had a range of bottled rums, which did the local market. But they had no sort of international marketing of a, of a bottling brand or anything yeah. like that, all, which is all terribly sad because the thing was there. So eventually they decided to close the distillery. And of course, they kept the cane fields going because it employed an awful lot of men going around with machetes, you know, cutting cane. And it was a very political decision, I think. Ben was asked to come in and do a valuation on the stock. Right. And and then uh, uh, they tried to do various sales of the stock. Various things came and went. Angostura bought some. They they tried to sell the whole operation to Angostura and the government wouldn't do it. And right. All the politics. Controversy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So in the end, that was it. And as they, we were there in 2001, Main Run bought some. We bought some from them. And then uh, we, through friends, uh, we were talking to the MD of, of, of Caroni. And he said, look, we've got stock here. You know, we, we've got one or two other customers who are taking quite big quantities. Mm -hmm. Some went to Colombia for blending. Some went to some of the other islands for, for blending into their local production. Right. And um, we, we've got a, a friend in Italy who's buying lots, which yeah. obviously was a we, we know him. And, and I, I say Luca is a brilliant guy. I mean, he's a brilliant salesman. And, and you know, uh, of anybody who can work up, talk up, and package beautifully. Yeah. I mean, his packaging is, is absolutely stunningly beautiful. And, yeah. you know, he is such a good salesman. And, and he's done such a lot for Karuni. But we were offered a parcel, and we shipped. I think it was about ten containers in the end. Oh, mm. and we moved. We moved between two thousand and eight and nine. We shipped them all in to UK, and that was on the basis of a deal that we took everything that was still there. So we took all the the, the odds and sods, the, the the bits and pieces, the and say the the. the the remnants they'd had from other things. Mm -hmm. took a large parcel of HTR, the, the, the heavy type rum, small amount of LTR, the light. But we also had things like steel drums of white rum. We had um, remnants of blends they'd had, casks that hadn't been bottled, some that had been reduced ready for bottling but hadn't been bottled and now fallen below strength. Uh, we had all manner of things. We, we simply said, look, you know, this is the deal. For this price, we'll do, we'll take everything. What, what, what gave you the confidence yes. to do that, though? Because, I mean, as you were saying, it's kind of like a, a grab bag, sort of, of, of well, yeah, different things. But, and a lot of it, you know, a little bit unusual, maybe. Um, like, were you, were you confident in it from day one that, like, this is going to be something that's going to be great? Well, Ben, ben said to me, he said, John, you know, this is really interesting. If I were you, I'd grab some. So I mm. thought, well, that was pretty good advice. <laughs> so the more we looked into it, the more we did. And it was the, at that time, I mean, 2009, 10 years, whatever it is a year ago, it was the largest um, purchase, the largest investment, the largest shipment we had made at that time. And it, it was a lot of stock. So we brought some over. We, we sold some to one or two friends pretty quickly, which offset obviously the costs and the shipping and okay. all the that it goes with it. We then put a lot of it into store and we thought, well, on earth do we do this? <laughs> so what I did to start with was to pick out those small amounts. And we had things like, I don't know, three barrels of 1974. Mm. So we thought, well, looking at these, you know, 
these are at the end of their tether, as Do it were. Do something with these quickly, yeah. Quickly, exactly. So we bottled those. We bottled some 89, which I think was is my personal favorite of, of all the vintages that we brought in. Uh, we then started sorting out the, the drums of white rum and the, the various little bits and pieces and started putting it out on the market. And I have to say, it wasn't an easy sell. It was not an easy sell. And people said, you know, what is this stuff? Where is it from? My God, it's strange. It's all, <laughs> it, it, it smells of diesel. And, and it, 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 it's, it's, you know, it's very extractive. It's very powerful. And you say, well, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. You know, this is what it is. And this is a it's a classic Caroni, right? There you exactly, go. Exactly. You know, I'm not I'm not asking you to say, you know, do you like it or not? All I'm saying to you is if you want to experience it, this is what it is. Hmm. So this sort of took a while to get going. And then thanks to Luca, actually, really, for his marketing of his range, that encouraged the whole Peroni story. And then we started gradually shipping it around to, you know, Scandinavia. We had a lot of interest in our Finnish, Swedish, Danish, Norwegian people. Uh, we started moving it to France. We started moving it around. And that's how it gradually built. But it didn't take off until 15, 16, 17, you know, these, these last okay. four or five years when the whole Peroni story has really sort of come on song. Right, and, right. And And... Pity, really, because we obviously wanted sold stock in the meantime, which now you wish you hadn't, right. because the price differential is enormous. Right. And whereas you buy for X, you can now sell it for 10 or 100 X, you know, whatever it is. And obviously the stock is diminishing. And as right. it goes down, it becomes more and more valuable, more and more mm-hmm. sought after. We've released a few barrels to various friends and customers saying, well, you could have one or two, and that's all we can do. And you know, we need to keep some for ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. But I've brought here, and if you can see it, ah. this, is, this is an original Peroni shipping sample as sent over by the company to us. Wow. Uh, yeah. this, this, this is, there's not much left in there, but this came over in the 5th of the 9th, 2009. There we are. From bond number three, row one, 1998 HTR, barrel number 1749. That's cool. And that's, cool. that's what we bought on, things like that. Yeah. And we've still got some of those sitting around. Are you ever going to drink that last little bit in there? <laughs> uh, I have some here. <laughs> <laughs> I have some here. I love and that. Um, it's still, it still has this... this slightly oily mm-hmm. diesel diesel smell to it yeah no i it's, it's so fascinating to think of kind of like the the journey of that rum and and as you were saying you know suddenly just in the last you know seven years or so really becoming even more valuable just as it becomes more and more scarce do you have any idea of how much longer you'll be able to sell coroni well i think there are two things one is how much longer would it be good in the wood that it's in right yeah. Now, the good news about that is that Caroni as a company did not invest in new wood. They kept using old wood, old wood, old wood. Gotcha. So it's less so, reactive. Mm-hmm. Less reactive. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So we have a longer time storage opportunity. So we're not under pressure from a quality point of view. We are able to extend it until where we feel happy with the actual perceived quality. That's still all okay. Um, we obviously have sales. We are restricting cask sales now. Okay. We have bottled sales, which we keep on pushing the price up all the time. I mean, I feel I feel like Robin Hood or a, a highwayman <laughs> as a robber. But but if you don't do that, the whole stuff, the whole stock is is purchased and then becomes a secondary trading item, and you see other people then double the right. price and right. take it up. So you think, well, I might as well have that margin myself because we made the investment. We actually took the risk. We actually put the money down. We actually have stored it for 15 years or whatever it is. We bottle it. We care for it. We talk about it. 
we sell it. So I think we deserve it. That's how I feel about it, you know. Don't give it to King John or the Sheriff of Nottingham. It's got to be you. That's right. Absolutely, absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> John, I wanted to ask, you've been in a lot of different places, obviously a lot of different places to find your rum. What have been some of your biggest surprises over the years? It, it could be a particular cask or maybe a distillery that you kind of found or how the market reacted to something maybe. What are, what are some things that stand out to you over the last few decades? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, I mean, I feel that the area which has so much potential and which has been overlooked in many ways is the Indian Ocean. Mm. And I yes. think Mauritius has the ability to produce really nice rum. The problem is maturation, wood, warehousing. But if you, if you could get all that in the right order, you could produce really nice things. What you mustn't do is stick cocoa beans and funny things into it and all the rest of it. You know, if you want to bring it into the EU, you've got to comply with the EU rules and regs. And so you don't want coffee-flavored rum. You don't want, you know, all this rubbish that goes into it occasionally. Yeah. Do make that a liqueur and sell as a liqueur, absolutely fine. I've got no problem with that. Then go to Reunion, which I think is a fascinating place because like the French islands in the Caribbean, you're part of France, so you come into the French legislation. So rum agricole is a production. Mm -hmm. And not everybody liked agricole style. And some of the more extreme uh, agricole styles are so vegetal and so um, cabbage-like, I think I would say. <laughs> I, always, I always think of cabbage when I think of really aggressive agricole. And, and those sort of smells of slightly cooked cabbage. But it gives variety to the, the, the palate of rum. It gives variety to the taste profile. It gives variety to the marketing story. It gives variety to the maturation cycle and, and all the rest of it. So if you take reunion where you can make agricole and molasses, Mm -hmm. you can actually produce quite a wide, a wide range of product, which can be really interesting. If you think also of years ago, British companies used to have um, Gilby's, where well, the one had a big distillery in, in Kenya and, and, and producing a sort of Bacardi lookalike, dry cane, they used to call it. I mean, there's an area. If you go up to India, where I mean, there's a lot of rum produced, yeah. Uh, uh, which, I mean, some of it is actually really serious. Mm -hmm. Some of it is a confection, but there's no reason why you can't make good product. If you look at malt whiskey, if you look at Indian whiskey production by some of the really serious Indian companies making, you know, people like Amrit and what have you are mm -hmm, making mm -hmm, mm -hmm. really super, super quality spirit. Forget where it comes from for a moment, but it is super quality spirit. There's no reason why you can't produce really good rum in India. I mean, if you can make really good whiskey in Taiwan. Or Japan. Mm -hmm. Or Japan. Mm -hmm. Why not, you know, why not elsewhere? So I think that whole sweep of the Indian Ocean and out into the East Indies is an area of really exciting potential, which hasn't really been exploited. And I think in the next 50 years, I think we're going to see a lot more from there. Hmm. I'm not knocking the Caribbean. That's not what I'm of saying. Of course not. Yeah, yeah, of course not. You know, if you look at Fiji, if you look at Australia, mm -hmm. uh, there's some yeah. super production down there, which, you know, can come around and, and, and be really interesting stock. Japan, you mentioned, I mean, there is rum production in Japan. Yeah. You know, all of these things can be wonderfully made. What you've got to do is convert from a small enthusiast's idea into a sustainable commercial right. operation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you need to get, you know, from that first 10,000 cases to the next 25, to the 50, to 100,000, to a million cases, and then basically you sell out to Diageo and you sit back <laughs> and take the money. But, but you know, it, it, it is developing that concept. Five-step plan. Is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so exciting. It's so exciting. Yo. Know, and I think I do believe the rum category has got such potential because 
if you go back to where I started, the rum pyramid. Yeah. Yes. You got rum drinking styles all the way up the pyramid, and starting from your your rum and ginger ale, your rum and coke, which has brought an amazing number of people into the rum category because you know it's actually it's a very appealing, easy drink to drink. Yeah. That leads them on to maybe spiced rum, but maybe something else and something else. But at least they're in the rum category as opposed to the whiskey category or the vodka category. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where we want to see them. Well, yeah. we've uh, we've we've covered a lot of ground with you. Uh, I was gonna this afternoon and this evening for you, John. We covered the whole rum pyramid. We went all the way back to the 1990s era of rum. I was going to wrap things up by asking you, you know, what should people look for next from uh, <laughs> from Bristol? But uh, but yeah, I know that's not your favorite thing to talk about. So any anything we didn't touch on that you wanted to uh, to mention before we wrap things up? Well. I think I, I would just reiterate what I said at the beginning. I mean, our business philosophy is is very simple. It's things I like, <laughs> things I'm happy to buy, things I'm happy to sell, and the kindness of friends who help me on the way. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. through these friends, and we have customers who become friends, family, you watch them growing up, you know, all this sort of thing. This is what makes the industry such an interesting and friendly and pleasant place to be. I mean, I'm so pleased I'm not selling, you know, widgets or or, <laughs> or things like that. But it's mean, a lot more fun, it, right? Within the spirit industry, there's a great sort of fraternal spirit. Yeah. And that is one of the joys of, of working in the industry, which we enjoy. Mm-hmm. Well, um, before we wrap things up, hopefully we can add a little bit to the fraternal spirit. Um, we have we have a tradition on the Rumcast. It's a uh, a bonus round of questions that we call our rapid fire round. These are questions that originate from the mind of my co-host John Gulla. Um, always unpredictable. Never know what which direction he's going to take things in. But usually, you know, ninety percent rum related. So um, <laughs> if you're up for it. We will uh, we will proceed to that now. Okay, fire away. All right, great. So I've uh, I've got sixty seconds on the clock. Are you ready, John? We are ready. ready. All right, both Johns are ready. Good. All right, sixty seconds and go. All right, neat or on the rocks? On the rocks. Okay, column, pot, or blend? Uh, pot. Ooh, okay. Aged or unaged rum? Aged. I thought that Saw would that be. One coming, yeah. yeah. Molasses or cane juice? Uh, that's really interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah. Could I blend the two? <laughs> sure. We'll you it, yeah. can. <laughs> yes. All right. Based on your predilections from learning about you this hour, um, which would you regrettably drink first? A cask strength overproof Trinidad, a super high ester Jamaican, or slightly cooked cabbage agricole rum? <laughs> wow. Gee. <laughs> Um, that's really difficult, but actually the highest of Jamaican can be really interesting. We We agree. Good answer. Uh, which country is making the best rum in the world right now, in your opinion? That's a tough one. These get tough. tough. Well, I am, I traditionally I'm Guyana, so that's where I'll go. All right. We'll, we'll stick with the tradition. Yes. Your favorite still at Demerara Distillers. Oh, well, yeah, well, it's going to be Pomerant, basically. Okay. All right. Ah, That's fair. A classic still. A (laughs) classic still. Uh, Your most underrated rum mixed drink. Uh, Rum and dry ginger ale. There's nothing nicer than really dry ginger ale. Not sweet, but dry ginger ale and really interesting rum. All right. And finally, to squeeze this one in, rather than ask what's coming next, I'll ask what's out right now from Bristol that you think is a bottle people should not not miss well we've we've got some really high ester from hamden which is really interesting it's a 2009 it's wonderfully wonderfully high estered nose and it's just so way out it's just off the scale of sort of nail varnish remover and <laughs> it, it, it is really lovely you're yeah, really, you're really it. selling it, but I know yeah. the the people in uh, listening who love Hampton will love that. I, I count myself among them, and we've gone yeah. way beyond time. Oh yeah, y- your responses were so good, we had to allow it. So I'll call Agreed. it there. All right. But uh, great job, great job, John. Okay. We appreciate the. Thank uh, you so much. John. Yeah, yeah, appreciate it. Um, everyone, well, go check out what uh, what Bristol Rum has to offer. B- Bristol Classic Rum has to offer right now. Uh, we'll put a link to the website in the show notes. You can see what's out from them right now. But. Um, 
Yes, John Barrett, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. John, well, great to meet you and great pleasure to talk to you. Obviously, very serious rum enthusiasts. Thank you very much. And we hope to see more Bristol in the U.S. soon. That's right. That's right. Especially in Florida. We're going to keep asking for it. (laughs) We'll work on that, I promise you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening to another episode of The Rumcast. Like we said during the show, be sure to check out the show notes. We'll put some links up to Bristol Classic Rum's website. You can check out their current range, keep up with what they have coming next. And like we said at the beginning of this episode, if you have any rum organization tips or if you've ever tasted Coroni while you're having a dental procedure... (laughs) please let us know so John doesn't feel like the weirdest person in the world. Um, I, I'm really desperate to know if anyone else has had that experience. So, John, if they are so inclined to, to fill us in on that, how, how can they get in touch with us? Oh, please get in touch with us at our social media accounts at The Rumcast. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter and YouTube. Uh, also, you can just email us uh, if you have a lengthy story like mine and you want to uh, tell us about that and email us that. It's host at at rumcast.com that's h-o-s-t at rumcast.com we love hearing from everybody whether it's dental related or not so uh please give us a shout out let us know what's going on in your rum corner as well we we really appreciate everything and thank you all so much for listening if you are looking to support the show will where do they go to support the show they go to patreon.com slash the rumcast that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash the rumcast and hey we have our monthly happy hour for a cast yeah Patreon patrons coming up in a few weeks in july those have been a blast we've also got another bonus episode on deck for all our patrons coming out soon so yeah you can support the show get some fun extra stuff and talk around with us so if you want to do that patreon.com slash the rumcast uh we hope to get to know all of you a little bit better there thanks everyone <laughs>